Thank you very much, Michael. As you can see, communication can be many different things. It can even be money directly coming to you. I just wonder uh, how they will develop it at the next stage. From mobile telephony and from money, we move into a completely different part of communication. And I welcome Professor John Ellis to talk a little bit about other aspects of communication. Very welcome. Thank you very much. So, uh, I was asked to talk about uh, post-World Wide Web challenges of uh, communicating. I sort of chose a sort of subtext, communicating particles. So, uh, this is a picture of the outskirts of uh, Geneva. Uh, I think some of you have had the opportunity to visit CERN during, your, uh, during the conference. So, what you see on this screen is uh, a big oval there. That is the layout of the big particle accelerator, the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, and you can judge how big it is by uh, seeing that on the right-hand side there, there's the uh, Geneva Airport runway. Uh, that's about five kilometers long. The circumference of the Large Hadron Collider is something like 27 kilometers. So th this is presumably the biggest scientific experiment ever. Uh, very high stakes, many stakeholders. I'll just talk to you a little bit about some of those in a moment. Large resources. Uh, cost is measured in, in billions of whatever currency units you have, unless they're yen. In which case, they're probably trillions. And uh, potentially big rewards, at least in uh, scientific terms. Now, uh, as many of you probably know, and as I will certainly remind you, uh, it was CERN at CERN that the World Wide Web was invented. Uh, not at a university laboratory, not at a software company. And I'll try to explain to you how this came to be. Communication has upsides, downsides, and more downsides. So, so sometimes you have a good message to communicate, like the discovery of the Higgs boson that I'll talk about. Sometimes you have a problem, like we had an electrical failure at CERN a few years ago. And sometimes, out of the blue, come concerns from the general public. You probably have this with, uh, I know, product liability or something. Uh, we had it a few years ago when people thought that we were going to blow up the planet with our experiments. Uh, in fact, I think we were able to turn that to our advantage, which perhaps indicates that there's indeed no such thing as bad publicity. So when I'm talking about what we do at CERN to a general public, I, I often like to use uh, as a background this uh, painting by uh, Paul Gauguin. So these people are asking themselves some very basic questions about the universe and our place in it. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? And you know, that, I would put to you, is what we physicists at CERN do as our day job. Uh, our job as particle physicists is to try to understand in simple terms what the universe is made of. So this is a, a picture of uh, the story so far. Uh, the universe uh, we learned last month is now 13.8 billion years. Uh, with a new experiment, its age increased by 100 million years in the case of one year. So uh, astronomers with their telescopes, they can look back towards the beginning. They can tell us that there was something very uh, hot and uh, right at the beginning, but they can't see inside what happened in the very, very early stages of the Big Bang. A and that's where we particle physicists come in. Basically, the experiments that we do at CERN recreate under controlled laboratory conditions what happened in the very early universe. So this is a subject which I think is of, of general interest. Certainly, we have uh, scientists from many different countries that are involved in our activities. So this is a, a map showing uh, well, the blue countries. Those are the countries that uh, are members of the CERN organization. Uh, the green countries, those are big non-European countries that collaborate with us. And the red countries, well, those are other countries that participate at some level in our program. So, uh, you know, most of the country is colored, uh, most of the world is colored. Uh, there's some countries that are, that are still white, including, I'm sorry to say, uh, Zimbabwe. No, no, Zimbabwe is colored now. Okay, we're making progress. Uh, there's actually over 10,000 scientists uh, who figure on this plot. And uh, this is uh, one of the principal things that they're engaged in looking for. 
Uh, you've undoubtedly heard about the Higgs boson. This is Mr. Higgs. Okay, he's a real person, and uh, here he is at his uh, desk in 1965, uh, looking at the details of his theory. And I'm sure that if you look down there, you could probably steal one or two good ideas from his desk. Okay, so how uh, do you get all these people to uh, work together? And uh, of course, the answer is the World Wide Web. So I remind you that uh, CERN was indeed the place where the World Wide Web was born. This is Tim Berners-Lee in sort of exultant mood about 20 years ago. Uh, and he invented the World Wide Web precisely in order to enable those thousands of scientists from those hundreds of countries around the world to collaborate together. Uh, in a real sense, particle physicists were the first online community. So the word that he used to describe this network of physicists was the web. And he said, well, this is something whose interconnections uh, vary over time. Zimbabwe joins, so the web extends, for example. Uh, we engaged in big collaborative projects. I talk about the project to discover the Higgs boson, but we have our other big projects as well. These projects generate enormous amounts of information. So what he wrote, in his proposal was that we have a pool of information which could grow and evolve with the organization and the projects that it describes. So uh, this is actually a copy of his proposal document, which was uh, sent into the CERN management 24 years ago. And it has this absolutely uh, wonderfully incomprehensible flow diagram on the front page. I defy anybody to, to figure out what the hell he's talking about. And indeed, uh, his manager at CERN also could... <laughs> Nevertheless, somehow or other, he got approval to uh, continue with his project, precisely, of course, because CERN saw this need to connect together all these thousands of scientists. Now, uh, as I said, the World Wide Web was invented at CERN. It was not invented at some university lab where you just have half a dozen people working around a, a lab desk. And it was also not invented in a software company. And indeed, Tim Berners-Lee actually proposed it to a software company. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Tim Berners-Lee talking to uh, Ian Ritchie, uh, a software developer in the uh, 1980s. And uh, Tim told Ian about the World Wide Web and how wonderful it was going to be. And basically, Ian said, this is a heap of crap. Uh, a guy from CERN is not going to do this. And uh, you know, if you don't believe me, there's a YouTube video which you can watch where Ian Ritchie explains in more detail why this was something that he did not find interesting. <laughs> so... Uh, Initially, uh, of course, the World Wide Web was a, a very nerdy thing. Uh, this is a, in fact, at CERN, we're trying to track down the very first web page. Uh, and this is actually not the first version of the first web page, but this takes you pretty much back to the, the beginning of the, the big web bang, if you like. And uh, as you can see, web page design has moved on quite a bit since then. Uh, this is uh, a little bit later. This is an early uh, screenshot. By the way, one thing I should have mentioned is that uh, Tim did his development work on uh, a Next computer, uh, which have uh, also bitten the dust along with some of the other electronic devices that we saw in the previous talk. So uh, Tim proposed this in uh, 1989. And uh, for four years, the thing was sort of chugging along within the nerd community. And it was growing. And precisely 20 years ago, CERN realized that there was just no way that it could manage this explosive development. And so CERN released uh, the World Wide Web to the world uh, precisely 20 years ago. And uh, in fact, we had a a big announcement uh, just a couple of weeks ago about the, uh, the publication, if you like, of the World Wide Web. If CERN had not done that, then you can just imagine what would have happened. 
there would have been 25 different World Wide Webs. There would have been a Google Web. There would have been a Microsoft Web. There would certainly have been an Apple Web. As it is, there's just one web. Okay, so uh, I've explained why it was that CERN developed this communication tool. Now the next question is, what do you communicate? So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about physics. Not very much. So uh, what we do at CERN is we study elementary particles. We, we try to study what happened in the very first stages of the Big Bang. Now, many of the advances in this field in the first half of the last century were actually not made with particle accelerators. Particle accelerators didn't exist. Instead, what we looked at was the energetic particles coming from outer space that had been bombarding the Earth for billions of years. Uh, these particles were uh, discovered by Victor Hess, whom you see going up here in a balloon uh, 101 years ago. So he discovered that there were these particles bombarding space, uh, from us from outer space. When they hit the upper atmosphere, their energy is converted into other particles. And we discovered lots of exciting things like antimatter, for example. But around the middle of the last century, physicists realized that if they wanted to really understand the details of what was going on, you'd have to do experiments under controlled laboratory conditions. And so that was how accelerators were born, basically to enable us to recreate in the laboratory and study in detail the experiments that nature has been conducting for billions of years. So these gave rise to something that we call rather prosaically, I'm afraid, the standard model of particle physics. So this describes matter. Uh, matter contains atoms, atoms contain nuclei, nuclei contain quarks, which is what you see on the left-hand side of that picture. Uh, going around the nuclei in atoms, you have electrons, so they're on the right-hand side of that picture. And in between, you've got neutrinos. Neutrinos were very much in the news uh, a year or so back, unfortunately, for all the wrong reasons. Now, between these particles, uh, there are various different forces. Uh, there's gravity, for example, that uh, keeps even theoretical physicists' feet firmly on the ground. Uh, electromagnetism, that's what we see with. That's what gives us radio. That's what gives us all these wonderful electronic devices that we've just heard about. And then inside nuclei, we have two forces. We have the strong force that holds nuclei together and the weak force that is responsible for radioactivity. So I like to think of what you see on this slide as being, in some sense, the cosmic DNA. Uh, these particles, these interactions, somehow encode all the information that you need to make all the visible stuff in the universe. Well, almost all the information. There's just one little detail that's missing. If you write down the equations of the standard model, it looks like nothing has any mass. Now, of course, we all know that things have mass, we have mass, particles have mass, and there was this missing link in the standard model. Where do masses come from? So uh, you may vaguely remember from, from school, some guy called Newton, telling you that uh, weight was proportional to mass. And you certainly remember Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared. Unfortunately, these two gentlemen somehow forgot to explain where mass comes from in the first place. And uh, that's where this guy comes in. This is uh, Mr. Higgs. And uh, on the blackboard behind him, uh, you see his theory. Now, I'm not sure whether you can read what's written on the blackboard. So. <laughs> My wife is sitting in the front row, so this is as far as I go. <laughs> anyway. So the top line here, 
describes the fundamental forces of nature, the second line, how those forces act on the particles, and the two bottom lines, that's Mr. Higgs. Now, according to his theory, uh, there should be a particle, which had not been seen, at least until the 4th of July last year. And this is, since it was proposed by Mr. Higgs, is what we call the Higgs boson. Uh, by the way, I should mention I'm now professor at King's College London, and so uh, he was a student there, although a long time before I came. So I, I'd like to propose a, an analogy for, for thinking about this, uh, how this Higgs idea works. So you're supposed to imagine that the universe is full of some sort of medium. Uh, think of a snowfield. We're in Switzerland. It's cold. You think that the universe is full of this infinite, flat, homogeneous field of snow. Now suppose you're trying to cross this snow. Well, if you're clever, you're going to have skis, and you're going to go skimming across the top. You're not going to sink into the snow. You're not going to interact with that Higgs snow field. It's like a particle that travels at the speed of light, uh, very fast, like the skier. Or you may have snowshoes. If you have snowshoes, then you sort of sink into the snow. You interact with that Higgs snow field. You travel slower than the skier. You travel at less than the speed of light. That's like a particle with mass, an electron, maybe. And if you're really unlucky, uh, you may be trying to cross this snow field just in your boots. Well, then you're really going to sink deeply into the snow. You're going to go very slowly. You're interacting very strongly with that Higgs field. You have a very large mass. You travel at much less than the speed of light. OK, so that's the basic idea. How do you test it? Well, what is snow made of? Snow is made of snowflakes, right? And it was the intuition of Mr. Higgs to say, well, there should be this smallest unit of this universal field, the Higgs boson. And that has become, in some sense, the holy grail of us particle physicists to try to find this particle. So the Large Hadron Collider, that I think some of you have had the chance to visit, uh, was built largely in order to see whether this theory is correct. As I mentioned, uh, 27 kilometers in circumference in a tunnel about 100 meters underground. Uh, when it's in full operation, you've got thousands of billions of particles going around in each direction. Uh, each of them has approximately the energy of a fly. You produce up to a billion collisions per second. And with that, you hope to unravel what was happening in the very early stages of the Big Bang. So I just want to take you through uh, the construction of just one of the pieces of apparatus that was detecting some of those elementary particles. 